Do tell me if you have trouble hearing me, and I can try and project a bit more. Um, Moshe Yalon, currently the Minister of Strategic Affairs in Netanyahu's government, said back in 2002, when he was the Israeli Defense Forces Chief of Staff, that the Palestinians must be made to understand in the deepest recesses of their consciousness that they are a defeated people. And this is exactly what was intended by Israel's barbaric assault on the flotilla and the massacre of nine Turkish activists. It is meant to send a signal to the Palestinians that they will be broken and that anyone who stands in solidarity with them will also be broken too. And this policy of attrition has long been a key Israeli strategy. The siege of Gaza, which has now entered its fourth year, is a tactic that is meant to break the Palestinian will to resist. But it is also meant to weaken Hamas support, and this is something that it has failed to do. If anything, the effect of the siege of Gaza has been to intensify Palestinian anger against Israel and to sap Palestinian support for Fatah, which is seen in the eyes of many Palestinians as a betrayer of the Palestinian cause. And Israel has been under largely symbolic pressure to lift the siege from members of the EU, the UN, and the US. But while all these diplomatic somersaults continue, I think we must remind ourselves what the siege has actually meant for the people inside Gaza. It has denied 1.5 million people in one of the world's most densely populated areas, critical medical supplies, building materials, fuel, and a long list of desperately needed food, uh, the absence of which has left 61% of Gazans food insecure. And according to recent documents submitted to an Israeli court, Israel even went so far as to calculate how many calories Gazans need to live. And if we go back to when the siege began, it should be clear to anyone that it was designed as a punitive measure for Hamas's election victory in 2006, when they were democratically elected and won an overwhelming majority. And this victory was born out of the anger and despair uh, at the political and economic bankruptcy of Fatah and the Palestinian Authority. This was later followed by a U.S. and Israeli engineered civil war in an attempt to destroy Hamas and then to isolate Hamas to Gaza, which is what they achieved, effectively severing the political unity of the Palestinians across the two territories. The flotilla massacre draws further attention to Israel's criminality and to Gaza's plight. And there is no doubt that Israel's assault on the Mavi Marmara was absolutely barbaric, and what it demonstrates is the growing extent to which Israel ceases to distinguish between Palestinians as legitimate targets and international and foreign activists. But it also says a lot about Israel's hatred of international solidarity with the Palestinian cause when it feels it has to violently extinguish any manifestation of this solidarity. And this is important because it reveals two things. On the one hand, it re reveals just how, just how much Israel is concerned with its perception in the world and with maintaining its legitimacy, something that the solidarity movement undermines. On the other, the flotilla assault reveals Israel's continuing disregard for international law and opinion and for human life. Moshe Dayan, Israel's most celebrated general, famously outlined the strategy that he believed would help to keep Israel's enemies at bay. He said, Israel must be like a mad dog, too dangerous to bother. And this is exactly what we're seeing. But the problem that Israel faces is that every time it tries to silence the solidarity movement through killing and maiming activists, it further exposes itself to international outcry and condemnation. And this will continue to pose problems for Israel over the coming months and years. But in order to understand Israel's mad dog tactics, we have to look back at the context of its colonial policies in the rest of Palestine. The occupation has strangulated Palestinian life for 40 years. It has forced Palestinians to live under tight restrictions with hundreds of military checkpoints across the West Bank, regular curfews of towns and cities, home demolitions, theft of water resources, settlement expansion, and of course the routine bombardment and killing of innocent civilians. And while the suffering of the Palestinians is widely understood in the context of the brutal occupation, which began in 1967, the root of the conflict does not start here. Simply calling for an end to occupation and a return to the 1967 borders glosses over the real issue, that being the colonial takeover of Palestine that began in 1948. And this culminated in what Palestinians call the Nakba, or the catastrophe, in which the Zionist movement uprooted over 800,000 Palestinians from their homes, cities, towns, 
and villages. Zionist militias like the Haganah and the Palmach raised over 500 villages to the ground and committed dozens of massacres with the aim of completely cleansing Palestine of its indigenous inhabitants. And the Nakba and over 60 years of ongoing Israeli colonization has now resulted in the theft of over 80% of historic Palestine. And if we look back at the last 15 years, there has actually been an accelerated drive by Israel towards colonizing the rest of the West Bank and East Jerusalem and also large parts of the Old City. And what this makes clear is that any talk of a two-state solution, as far as Israel is concerned, has always been completely meaningless. But it's also vital to understand that Israel could not behave as it does without the enormous support of U.S. tax dollars and without the funding and financing of the U.S. government. Israel has consistently been the largest recipient of U.S. aid for decades, second only to Iraq following the invasion in 2003. And it's also the case that the British government continues to be complicit in Israeli war crimes by supplying Israel with British-made weapons, many of which were used during Operation Cast Lead, in which 1,300 civilians were killed. Of course, Israel was born out of the colonial Zionist, uh, Zionist movement, uh, and its birth was facilitated and made possible by Western, particularly British imperialism. And this is precisely because it was seen as advantageous to have a predominantly European settler ally in the region that could help to protect Western interests and power. And in this way, Israel behaves as a watchdog of Western imperialism, but it's also one that is straining at the leash. It would be wrong to think, therefore, that Israel is completely subservient to the U.S., but at the same time, it would be wrong to think that the United States does not have the power to pull the plug on Israel if it becomes more of a liability than an asset over the long term. There are a number of problems, of course, facing Israel and the grip of U.S. imperialism in the region. And this is important because anything that threatens America's grip on the Middle East also threatens Israel's ability to survive in the long term. The United States is bogged down in two wars, both of which it is losing, in Iraq and Afghanistan, and it has completely failed at winning the battle for hearts and minds. If anything, its wars and occupations have further inflamed anti-American uh, anti feeling and, and resistance. There is also the situation with Iran, which continues to pursue a nuclear program while maintaining that it's peaceful and completely disregarding Israeli and American threats of war and sanctions. America's tough diplomacy isn't working, and the Middle East is increasingly unstable as a result of U.S. foreign policy. And though an attack on Iran is very possible, this would, of course, have disastrous consequences for the entire region and the balance of power that exists. It's also the case that Israel's military might was deeply undermined with its defeat at the hands of Hezbollah in 2006, which aside from being a humiliating military defeat, was a profound political defeat as well. But Israel is also facing political isolation in the eyes of the world. International public opinion is and has been for some time shifting decisively towards solidarity with the Palestinian cause and millions view Israel increasingly with disgust and outrage. The Goldstone Report which followed Israel's war on Gaza, was a damning indictment of Israeli war crimes. And this came from Richard Goldstone, himself a South African former judge and self-confessed Zionist who was appalled at the war on Gaza and what he saw when he visited the Gaza Strip in its aftermath. But more importantly, perhaps, is the growing movement for boycott, divestment, and sanctions. The BDS movement is unprecedented in the, history, uh, in the history of struggle against Israeli apartheid and occupation. And this is making Israel very nervous. An influential Israeli think tank, the Reut Institute, recently published a report called the Delegitimization Challenge. And its main focus was on how best to counter the growing movement for justice in Palestine and specifically the BDS campaign. So the question that many around the world and many in this room are asking is how can Palestine be free? Well, the first thing is to say that even after two popular uprisings or intifadas and decades of resistance, the Palestinians simply cannot win on their own. They are at a unique disadvantage in that they are being colonized and occupied by the fourth most powerful military in the world, backed by the United States, and also the defeat of the Palestinian movement in the 60s and 70s, and the ability of Palestinians to wage an effective armed struggle just doesn't exist anymore. But that's not to say that Palestinian resistance is futile or ineffective. There are very important resistance struggles that are taking place today in Palestine, such as that against the wall in places like Bilain and against the evictions of Arab families in East Jerusalem. It is also the case that the leadership 
of Israel's large Palestinian minority is increasingly starting to question the legitimacy of the Jewish state in ways that it would, would have been completely unthinkable only a few years ago. But Palestinians are missing a vital weapon that could be used to defeat a colonial power like Israel. Unlike South Africa, they don't have the economic weight or labor power that was used to bring apartheid to its knees. And the Israelis were very quick to understand just how important it was to abandon any reliance on Arab labor many years ago. What destroyed the South African regime under apartheid was the mass working class movement of black South Africans and the strike waves that shook the system and the economy at its core. Tens of thousands of black workers took part in collective action that had a crippling effect on the economy. And this was joined by an international anti-apartheid movement, the combination of which brought about the inevitable collapse of white minority rule. And although the Palestinians continue to resist, they do not have the same weapon that the South Africans had at their disposal. And it is clear, therefore, that the struggle against Zionism is inextricably tied up with the fate of the imperial order and the region and at the fate of the Arab regimes that prop it up. The key, therefore, to freeing Palestine lies in the coming together of two potentially very powerful movements and struggles. On the one hand, the global movement that isolates Israel and makes it a pariah state, and on the other, the rising wave of working class struggle, particularly in a place like Egypt, that has the potential to spread and to bring down the corrupt regimes and the imperial order that is able to keep Israel alive. As Tony Cliff used to say, the road to Palestinian liberation runs through Cairo. Over the past decade in Egypt, there has been a growing mass movement for change from below that has brought hundreds of thousands of people onto the streets in protest since 2000. And this started with the huge solidarity protests during the Palestinian Intifada and then was followed by the huge mobilizations against the invasion of Iraq in 2003. In 2004, the Kefaya movement was born. Kefaya meaning enough that being the first popular movement in three generations that directly challenged the legitimacy and the grip of Mubarak's regime. And this has brought together democracy activists, workers, students, and opposition groups to collectively protest against Egypt's dictatorship. This political anger and protest has now fused with the emergence of a new workers' movement that was sparked by mass strikes in the textile industry in 2006. Since then, every sector of the Egyptian economy has been shaken by strikes and factory occupations against the brutal effects of neoliberalism, and this struggle is continuing. After the flotilla massacre, protesters took to the streets in Egypt and chanted, Mubarak the Zionist, and down with the siege, down with Mubarak. It is this fusing of political anger with issues like Palestine, with the working class struggle against the regime, that is so worrying to Mubarak and his cronies. And this is the reason why Mubarak has consistently opened the Rafah crossing. In terms of what we can do here, the BDS has to be central. It is already gaining momentum and has the potential to expand into new forms of struggle. The work of isolating Israel and of severing links institutionally in the universities and in cultural organizations is vital in breaking the process of normalization that gives Israel its legitimacy. But the BDS also has the potential to hit Israel in other ways by drawing in trade unionists, workers and activists to use their collective power in support of the Palestinian cause. And I'll just give an example from the US involving the longshoremen in Oakland, California, who recently refused to cross a community organized picket line and to unload goods from an Israeli cargo ship on June 20th following the flotilla massacre. Around 500 workers and their supporters staged an early morning rally at the port in Oakland uh, as the Israeli cargo ship was scheduled to arrive, waving Palestinian and Turkish flags and chanting, free, free Palestine, don't cross the picket line. They won the support of the longshoremen who agreed not to offload the ship and who joined them in their protest. An organizer at the rally said, we want to send a clear message that if you commit acts of piracy on the high seas, if you attack and murder civilians in cold blood, if you build an apartheid wall, if you appoint a racist minister like Avigdor Lieberman who calls for the expulsion of all Palestinians, then we will not honor your cargo here at the port of Oakland. And what this shows finally is the potential of anger and resistance against Israel to turn into a very dangerous rep weapon of organized collective action. And it is this action along with the collective resistance of people in Palestine and across the region for a Middle East free from war and imperialism, Zionism and oppression, that has the potential to grow into a truly borderless intifada that can seriously threaten Israel's ability to exist as a colonial apartheid state. And the time is now.
Thank you. Thank you, Janan. I'll now give the mic to Kevin Ogden. After the British Empire murdered Irish freedom fighters following the Easter uprising of 1916, strapping them to a chair, the better to execute them, the great Irish poet William Butler Yeats wrote, all changed, changed utterly. Following the Bloody Monday, the massacre of the Mavi Marmara on the Eastern Mediterranean, we can complete Yeats's compl uh, couplet afresh. A new phase of struggle is born, but it has come at a terrible price. Nine brothers taken from us, shot dead aboard the Mavi Marmara. Scores more wounded. But their blood was not shed in vain because the tide has turned and we must now seize this tide if we are to make a decisive advance in the struggle in Palestine, in the Middle East and in the wider world. We remember the nine who were killed. I remember them. Some of them were friends of mine. I travelled with them on the last land convoy to Gaza in December last year, January of this. I remember the brother one metre in front of me who was shot through the leg. The brother 50 centimetres to the back right of me shot through the abdomen. The brother, alongside a friend of mine, Nikki Enchmarch, who also works for Viva Palestina, holding a stills camera, who was shot through the forehead, the bullets, the high-velocity bullets, blowing away the back third of his skull, cradled by Nikki as the last few seconds of his life passed away. All three were on a deck where there were no Israeli commandos within the immediate proximity. Simply unshot from above, simply unfeasible for those who fired those bullets to claim that in any sense they were acting in fear of their lives. And the truth is coming out. The testimony I could go on for very long with things that I saw, things that others saw. The truth is coming out and it will be gathered in a, for an international tribunal, not, of course, the whitewash tribunal that the Israelis have announced and to which the government of the United States, Britain and indeed the United Nations have acceded. A tribunal whose bona fide of impartiality and independence is the present on it, presence on it of one Lord Trimble, a man who two months ago became a founder of a new Friends of Israel initiative, but to be fair, does bring some independence and some skill to the task of investigating the massacre of nine innocents, because he was, of course, a pillar of the Unionist establishment, which was complicit in covering up the massacre of 14 innocents 38 years ago. We want an independent inquiry, but we don't need an independent inquiry, because millions of people have rightly already drawn the conclusions from the bald and blood-soaked facts, which are very straightforward. On the one hand, nine unarmed people shot dead. On the other, a few roughed-up Israeli commandos. As they say on the other side of the Atlantic, go figure. And millions of people have gone and figured. And so Israel was thrown immediately onto the back foot rocking on its heels. I want to congratulate and thank, I imagine, everybody in this room who, within hours, took to the streets of their towns and cities on that Bank Holiday Monday. People not just in this country, but I was in the United States recently, and not just in the major cities, San Francisco, Chicago, Boston, New York, but in small towns in the Midwest, people took to the streets in protest at the massacre. Israel rocked onto the back foot, but is immediately attempting to get back onto the front foot. And it's important that we understand strategically what they're trying to do and how it is that we need to respond. What the governments in Tel Aviv and Washington are now attempting to do is to isolate, to denigrate, and to calumniate against the most advanced section of the movement which led the flotilla that was so brutally attacked, and that is the Turkish civil society movement led by the courageous organization, the IHH. And we, as an international movement, cannot allow 
the people who've paid the biggest price and are most in advance to be encircled, isolated and thrown back. And to resist that, it means that across the world, from Vancouver to Legvan, from California to Cairo, we must all link arms now and together take a step into the front rank of the movement. And we must refute and resist the specious, disgusting arguments that they're attempting to deploy. We must refute the idea that the mass, democratic, politically and civil civilly engaged Islamic movements in Turkey and in other countries have any affinity whatsoever with the nihilist sectarians of Al-Qaeda, which is what they're attempting to claim. They're the antidotes to the, uh, to, 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 to the uh, destructive nihilism of Al-Qaeda, as are we. And then there's the argument that, in some sense, the massacre aboard the Mavi Marmara was the responsibility of those of us aboard. That, in some sense, Israel was attacked. Attacked. Attacked by 61-year-old Ibrahim Bilgen, a father of six, a man who was a candidate for mayor in forthcoming elections in his hometown. Attacked by 38-year-old Jevdet Kilicla, father of two small children, an outstanding journalist, photographer and internet designer. I'm minded of what Malcolm, Malcolm X, would have said about this. Oh, you see... We didn't land on Israel, Israel landed on us. And in those circumstances, faced with brutal and lethal force, under all the great moral, legal and political codes, people have an absolute right to defend themselves with their bare hands or with whatever lies to hand. And it is because people defended themselves, it is because there was collective resistance aboard the Mavi Marmara that this event has had such a profound impact. That and the fact that it intersected with important processes, some of which Jinan touched upon, which have been underway for some years. And I want to outline what they are and then move to what I think it means for the movement which now has the chance to grow, into be, uh, grow, grow to become a truly mass movement. The first is that the political capital of Israel, leave aside its hard power, which we experienced firsthand aboard the Mavi Marmara, but its soft power, its standing in the world, its ability to call uh, on governments and peoples and institutions for loyalty, has been withering and wasting for many, many years. You see, there was a time, and some people in the room are old enough to remember it, when Israel was regarded as some kind of Sweden on the eastern Mediterranean, surrounded by a sea of backward and feudal Arabs, a welfare state plus nice beaches. That picture from the 1960s and 70s is long gone. And the image that we now have is uh, the faces of Benjamin Netanyahu, Avigdor Lieberman, and Mark Regev. And they are ugly faces to present to the world if you're seeking to generate world sympathy. And it's been accelerating in the last four years. The attack upon Lebanon, which resulted in military and political defeat at the hands of Hezbollah and the national resistance in Lebanon. The compensatory attack 18 months ago on the people of Gaza, which could murder 1,417, but not achieve its military objectives and lead to a profound political isolation. The fact that, in this country, many people who didn't really think or perhaps didn't even care about the Middle East, earlier this year woke up to find that if they were planning to go on holiday or on business to Dubai on a British passport, that the Israelis had seen to it that they may well be taken for a Mossad agent because despite the affinity between the British government and Israel, Israel stole and, fo uh, 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 stole and forged uh, British passports in order to carry out the assassination of uh, al-Mabou in Dubai. Weakening 
capital, so much so that the standing of Israel in the world now is weaker than at any time since the inception of the Zionist entity 62 years ago. And as a consequence of that, and this is the second process, there has been a rising movement for some time, a rising call to isolate Israel, apartheid Israel, in the way in which South African apartheid was isolated. And within that, a growing movement to directly confront the siege upon the people of Gaza. The increase in the number of uh, convoys, the three convoys which Viva Palestina has organized, taking 100, 200, 250 vehicles, breaking the siege on Gaza. The move from individual ships traveling through the eastern Mediterranean to the last effort, which had six ships, including the large passenger ship, the Mavi Marmara, directly confronting the siege. At this point, why Gaza and why the siege? Gaza isn't the entirety of Palestine. The ending of the siege is not the same as the ending of the oppression of the Palestinians, but it's the enemy that's made Gaza the focus. The enemy has decided to isolate the citadel of Palestinian resistance in the only non-occupied slither of land in Palestine, and therefore all our efforts have to be geared around the lifting of that siege, the defense of the resistance in Gaza, in order for the movement for the liberation of Palestine as a whole to make, uh, 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 to make advances. There's a third process as well. Jinan outlined some of the imperialist interests and regional interests inside the Middle East, the geopolitical interests, which have locked in the oppression of the Palestinians for so long, and that includes more than simply Israel itself. But there are shifts, changes, fr fractures in the geopolitical plates inside the Middle East. Put simply, perhaps too simply, you didn't have to be Henry Kissinger or Zbigniew Brzezinski to know that if you knocked out Ba'athist Iraq in 2003, that the Islamic Republic of Iran would increase in power and prestige inside the Middle East. That was obvious. But it was also predictable and predicted that other regional actors would seek to, fulfill, seek to fill the resultant power vacuum. And underlying all the political processes in Ankara, in Turkey, and the uh, policies of the AKP government is essentially the fact that the dominant wing of the Turkish establishment is now set upon a course of renegotiating the relationship between Turkey and its historic ally, the United States, and within that, an embedded relationship between the Turkish military and the Israeli military. Not all one way, balancing backwards and forwards so that there could be a secret meeting, although the fact we know about it means it's obviously not so secret, between the Turkish foreign minister and a representative of uh, the uh, Benjamin Netanyahu uh, last, uh, last week to seek to repair the damage caused by the uh, assault on the Mavi Marmara, but certainly a renegotiation and uh, conflict uh, emerging between the different states inside the Middle East and between various imperial sponsors. What I'm not saying is that the attempt by Turkey to use its economic and cultural capital to extend its influence into the Balkans, into Central Asia, and indeed to usurp Egypt as, in effect, the leading state in the Arab world, even though it's not Arab. I'm not saying that the these state actors will bring about advances for the movement, but the actions of these states will open up and are opening up the fissures through which the movement can advance much more strongly. And you see this in terms of the questioning which is taking place, and I wouldn't put it any more than questioning, of the up to now absolutely taken for granted relationship between Washington and Tel Aviv. There remain very powerful structural connections, principally through the military industrial complex. But David Petraeus, now in charge of US forces, NATO forces in Afghanistan, recently told the Senate committee, the Senate Armed Services Committee, that he felt that Israel had gone from being a strategic asset to a strategic liability. The head of Mossad, in Israel said he feared that in the United States that they could see Israel as a burden rather than an asset. The Israeli ambassador to Washington in a leaked briefing to his diplomats fears that the relationship with the White House is not 
as emotionally strong as it might be, and therefore, in his words, there's a danger that uh, uh, Barack Obama could take a cool and calculating look at US interests rather than simply autom automatically backing Israel. I'm not saying that Obama's going to do that, but the fear is that if the US establishment were to take a different look, were to look rationally at what it's, uh, at what it's doing, that they could end up loosening the link with Israel. Whether this happens or not rem remains to be seen. Very powerful forces to prevent this happening. But it is an indication that the situation is not static and points of conflict, points of pressure, points opening, opening points for the movement can emerge. And this is the final thing I want to end on. In order for this to happen, to ad advance and turn this turning point into a decisive turning point, the movement has to change itself, in my view. All movements need activists, but we cannot simply be a movement of activists. It, because, it must become a movement of people for whom Palestine has become the lightning arrester, the symbol of the struggle against international injustice, the struggle against imperialism, many, many millions of them. It must become a movement, ultimately, which connects with social forces, mass democratic forces, not just in this country, but principally inside the Middle East, where the power to end this suffering once and for all lasts, uh, uh, lies. And therefore, the next steps for the movement. People ask me, after the massacre of the Mavi Marmara, whether there will be more convoys and flotillas. There will be more convoys and flotillas, and they're leaving on the 18th of September. The land convoy will be in three limbs, from London through Europe, down to Aqaba in Jordan, from Doha, up the Arabian Gulf to Jordan, from Casablanca across North Africa to Egypt, rendezvousing with the other two at the gates of Rafa in Egypt. Why Rafa and Egypt? Because it has to be said that this siege is imposed from the north and from the south. Rafa is an Arab-Arab crossing. If the declaration, the words from Cairo, were fully followed through, and the Rafa crossing was truly open to the free movement of goods and people, then Israel could go and whistle in the dark because the siege would end the moment that that took place. And it's through Rafa because we want to connect with the very rising feeling throughout the Arab world and in particular in Egypt. Simultaneously, there will be a flotilla, a bigger flotilla, mustering at ports throughout the Mediterranean to meet together off the coast of Gaza at the same time as we intend to go through Rafa. And on that day, the goods and the people will steam and drive towards Gaza and we will aim to end the siege once and for all on that day. And I invite all those who want to be part of it to take part. And of course, these are the cutting edge behind which stand many thousands of people. Let me just end on this point. Two vehicles went last time from, from Dewsbury in the north of England. Six people involved. Behind them literally stood 1,200 people, principally from the Gujarati community, who saw off those vehicles. Behind them stood 15,000 people who donated for the, uh, the, the uh, aid and the uh, cost of the ambulances that were taken. This is not an alternative to a mass movement. This is a cutting edge of a wider mass movement within which people need different points of entry. When I went to university in 1986, few of us knew the full bloody connections between British capitalism and apartheid South Africa. But every student at college knew on the first day you do not buy outspan fruit and you do not bank at Barclays. We need to popularize the limited set of ideas, the limited boycotts, around which many millions of people can uh, 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 organise and take part. Building collectively through universities breaking links, through building on the model in Birmingham City Council where Salma Yaqub was able to get cross-party support to move towards uh, breaking links between Birmingham City Council and divesting from Israel. There are many, many different avenues which can reinforce one another. Let me just end on this. With the rising movement, we need two things. We need to set strategic milestones in order for the movement to cohere and regroup as it moves forward, and this has been done through a high level of international coordination. We also need power to the imagination where people feel at any level whatsoever that they can connect with the movement. When that happened in the struggle against apartheid, a young woman, Mary Manning, 21 years old, in Dunn's store in Dublin, 
saw that a customer wanted to buy outspan grapefruit. She heard from the union that that was banned. She refused to serve the customer. She was sacked, but there was a strike that went on for a year. It became a cause celebre. Everybody knew about it, and it propelled the international movement. That is within our grasp today if we seize the time to catch this changing tide which has come at such a great price. Thank you very much for the discussion. On Theresa's question about disappearances in the West Bank and people reappearing in the, uh, in the Gaza Strip. Uh, I can't give you a definitive answer to that. Uh, certainly, many di Palestinians disappear from the West Bank. There's a lot of talk about Corporal Gilad Shalit, the uh, most famous corporal in the, uh, in the world. A uh, little about the 11,000 uh, Palestinian prisoners, many of them children and women who are held in Israeli dungeons. But that's something which we should uh, investigate more. Uh, Sabi raised the point about the alienation between Israel and Turkey, which predates the, the convoy, uh, the attack on the flotilla. People remember in 2003, one of the greatest successes of the international anti-war movement was that the Turkish parliament voted against allowing uh, the 14 military bases in Turkey, including the crucial one of Injaluk, uh, to be used in the invasion of Iraq, something which had a material effect on the course of the war because they couldn't invade from the north, which gave time for the uh, Iraqi resistance to organise. Earlier this year in February, the uh, Israeli government summoned the Turkish ambassador uh, to a meeting which was televised uh, to complain about a a uh, TV program called Wolf's Wadi, which is very popular, it's a Turkish program, but very popular in the Arab world, which shows the Israelis in a particularly bad light, or one might say in an entirely accurate light. And they made the ambassador sit on a low chair while Danny Elon was sat on a high chair and he said in Hebrew that look how short this man is and so on. This particular political genius had the result of the seemingly impossible of uniting the nationalist left and the nationalist right in Turkey all behind an Islamist government. So we shouldn't think that they, wily as they can be, we shouldn't underestimate the other side, but we shouldn't think that they uh, have all the cards or play them particularly successfully. China raised a very important issue of the sea change in the United States. Now, I know often people can say that there's a sea change and actually it's just relating possibly a couple of discussions that they've had, but China's absolutely right. It's borne out by seasoned activists in the United States, notwithstanding the repression that particularly Muslim activists uh, are facing. Uh, to give you an example of that repression, there are people who ran the charity the Holy Land Foundation, which was not even accused of providing material assistance to Hamas, but simply providing assistance in uh, Gaza, uh, one of whom has been sent to prison for 65 years. That was under the end of the Bush regime, and there's a campaign to get him out. But there is indeed a sea change. There was an article uh, a little over a month ago in the New York Review of Books by an associate professor at, I think, Columbia University, a man called Peter Beinart, who uh, is a liberal Zionist, and he was surveying young Jewish opinion in the US and he found that uh, leaving aside the orthodox which is increasingly a political rather than a religious description in the United States that young Jewish people on campus in the US were much more likely to regard Israel as them rather than us much more likely to be open to uh, the Palestinian case in cases where the evidence of atrocities was presented to them and much more likely to hold Israel to the same universal standards of behaviour that they would hold any other state to, which is a remarkable shift. And he worried that there is now uh, an undermining, literally an undermining, of the phalanx of Jewish Zionist organisation in the US pinnacle of which is APAC, which increasingly is not speaking for the next generation of young Jewish people. And this is a profound shift which uh, the movement in the United States is attempting to connect with and so on. None of this is going to happen tomorrow. It's a question of what the line of travel is. I don't want people to think that this is a truncated process. It's a, an ongoing and longer process. Ben raised the question about the uh, decay inside of Israeli society and the dysfunctionality of Israeli society and this is absolutely true it's not been able to deliver uh, on all of the promises of Ben Gurion and uh, and so on and so increasingly 
certainly militarily and economically, has become dependent upon the United States. Many Israeli companies are, in essence, uh, local subsidiaries of American companies, which, again, in, m means that the fear inside of Israel that if there were to, there were to be any even slightly uh, a delinking, let alone sundering of those connections, that they really would be in a mess. But at the same time as that, because of the structure of it being a colonial settler state, ideologically, and the ideology has a material underpinning, that in fact, despite the very small and brave minority who've moved to the left under the impacts of the Gaza atrocities and the, the Netanyahu government, the bulk of Israeli society has moved to the right, unfortunate to say. Um, I mean, I can testify to this, that as we left uh, Besheva prison on the road, which interestingly, the road points one way to Tel Aviv, the other way to Dimona, which is the uh, Israeli nuclear uh, facility, uh, on the road to Tel Aviv, there were people in cars, not rich cars, just normal cars, uh, uh, going like this, you know, celebrating the fact that nine people had been killed. And the material underpinning of it is this, that whatever uh, uh, depredations the poorest people face in Israel, and often that's uh, people who are not from the Ashkenazi Jewish uh, pioneer settlers, but from the, the, the Arab world, from uh, the, uh, uh, the Falasha, from Ethiopia, and so on. Whatever that, the average living standard in Israel is about $25,000 a year, which is 40 times what it is in Gaza, which is a huge gap. It's the gap which was the gap between chief executives and workers in this country 20 years ago, 15 years ago. That's to give you some idea of the gap. So the ideologies can be broken, but in all likelihood, the dominant section of, of Israeli society will move to the right, as indeed it did in South Africa, until the writing was on the wall, and they had to come to a settlement because if they didn't come to a settlement at that point, they feared losing everything. And how the social forces are mustered, people are absolutely right, is clearly within Palestine, within Israel, with an awakening of the Arab minority in Israel. Three Arab MPs have uh, just had their citizenship revoked and they're seeking sanctuary in Jerusalem, which is an indication, again, of just how undemocratic uh, Israeli society is within Israel, within Palestine, and in the broader Middle East, above all in, in uh, Egypt. Just the final, the very final point. Austin from the Civil Service Union raised the importance of trade union organization, trade unions being involved in this growing movement around the isolation of Israel through boycotting and around the uh, flotilla. I'm pleased to say that following the attack on the Mavi Marmara, there's now very significant trade union figures, amongst them Hugh Lanning, who's also the chair of the Palestine Solidarity Campaign, who are very keen to have an organized labor movement presence on the forthcoming convoy and flotilla, which will uh, head off from London just after the TUC and will have a launch at the TUC. I just say this, that in all our experience, that the movement amongst organized labor always comes from two directions. The winning of the positions and advancing the position, as Tom outlined, beyond that, which is a step forward, the TUC's position, but advancing that further at the top, but also creating the climate, the general climate inside society, where no self-respecting person would bank with Barclays or buy outspan grapefruit. We need to do exactly the same inside uh, the, 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 the movement today over uh, isolating apartheid Israel. And if that general climate is created, it will intersect with people whose names we don't yet know, but people like Mary Manning did in 1985. And this is the way that the movement can advance, in my view. The very final thing is, for a long period of time, in the 70s, even into the 1980s, apartheid seemed invulnerable. It seemed that they could do whatever they liked. The apartheid regime could murder 69, not nine, 69 people in Sharpeville. It could gun down Hector Peterson and hundreds of school students in Soweto. It could torture and execute our prince, Steve Biko, assassinate the lion, Chris Harney. But Nelson Mandela walked free. Apartheid did fall. The tide of history is in our direction. Israeli apartheid will fall.